Section 10 of the State of the Union Addresses, 1845 to 1848. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. James Polk, December 5th, 1848. Part 1. Fellow Citizens of the Senate and of the House of Representatives. Under the benignant providence of Almighty God, the representatives of the states and of the people are again brought together to deliberate for the public good. The gratitude of the nation to the sovereign arbiter of all human events should be commensurate with the boundless blessings which we enjoy. Peace, plenty, and contentment reign throughout our borders, and our beloved country presents a sublime moral spectacle to the world. The troubled and unsettled condition of some of the principal European powers has had a necessary tendency to check and embarrass trade, and to depress prices throughout all commercial nations. But notwithstanding these causes, the United States, with their abundant products, have felt their effects less severely than any other country, and all our great interests are still prosperous and successful. In reviewing the great events of the past year, and contrasting the agitated and disturbed state of other countries with our own tranquil and happy condition, we may congratulate ourselves that we are the most favored people on the face of the earth. While the people of other countries are struggling to establish free institutions under which man may govern himself, we are in the actual enjoyment of them, a rich inheritance from our fathers. While enlightened nations of Europe are convulsed and distracted by civil war or intestine strife, we settle all our political controversies by the peaceful exercise of the rights of free men at the ballot box. The great Republican maxim, so deeply engraven on the hearts of our people, that the will of the majority, constitutionally expressed, shall prevail, is our sure safeguard against force and violence. It is a subject of just pride that our fame and character as a nation continue rapidly to advance in the estimation of the civilized world. To our wise and free institutions it is to be attributed that while other nations have achieved glory at the price of the suffering, distress, and impoverishment of their people, we have won our honorable position in the midst of an uninterrupted prosperity and of an increasing individual comfort and happiness. I am happy to inform you that our relations with all nations are friendly and pacific. Advantageous treaties of commerce have been concluded within the last four years with New Granada, Peru, the two Sicilies, Belgium, Hanover, Oldenburg, and Mecklenburg-Schwerin. Pursuing our example, the restrictive system of Great Britain, our principal foreign customer, has been relaxed. A more liberal commercial policy has been adopted by other enlightened nations, and our trade has been greatly enlarged and extended. Our country stands higher in the respect of the world than at any former period. To continue to occupy this proud position, it is only necessary to preserve peace and faithfully adhere to the great and fundamental principle of our foreign policy of non-interference in the domestic concerns of other nations. We recognize in all nations the right which we enjoy ourselves, to change and reform their political institutions according to their own will and pleasure. Hence, we do not look behind existing governments capable of maintaining their own authority. We recognize all such actual governments, not only from the dictates of true policy, but from a sacred regard for the independence of nations. While this is our settled policy, it does not follow that we can ever be indifferent spectators of the progress of liberal principles. The government and people of the United States hailed with enthusiasm and delight the establishment of the French Republic as we now hail the efforts in progress to unite the states of Germany in a confederation similar in many respects to our own federal union. If the great and enlightened German states, occupying as they do a central and commanding position in Europe, shall succeed in establishing such a confederated government, securing at the same time to the citizens of each state local governments adapted to the peculiar condition of each, with unrestricted trade and intercourse with each other, it will be an important era in the history of human events. Whilst it will consolidate and strengthen the power of Germany, it must essentially promote the cause of peace, commerce, civilization, and constitutional liberty throughout the world. 
with all the governments on this continent our relations it is believed are now on a more friendly and satisfactory footing than they have ever been at any former period since the exchange of ratifications of the treaty of peace with mexico our intercourse with the government of that republic has been of the most friendly character the envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary of the united states to mexico has been received and accredited and a diplomatic representative from mexico of similar rank has been received and accredited by this government the amicable relations between the two countries which had been suspended have been happily restored and are destined i trust to be long preserved the two republics both situated on this continent and with coterminous territories have every motive of sympathy and of interest to bind them together in perpetual amity this gratifying condition of our foreign relations renders it unnecessary for me to call your attention more specifically to them it has been my constant aim and desire to cultivate peace and commerce with all nations tranquillity at home and peaceful relations abroad constitute the true permanent policy of our country war the scourge of nations sometimes becomes inevitable but is always to be avoided when it can be done consistently with the rights and honor of a nation one of the most important results of the war into which we were recently forced with a neighboring nation is the demonstration it has afforded of the military strength of our country before the late war with mexico european and other foreign powers entertained imperfect and erroneous views of our physical strength as a nation and of our ability to prosecute war and especially a war waged out of our own country they saw that our standing army on the peace establishment did not exceed ten thousand men accustomed to themselves to maintain in peace large standing armies for the protection of thrones against their own subjects as well as against foreign enemies they had not conceived that it was possible for a nation without such an army well disciplined and of long service to wage war successfully they held in low repute our militia and were far from regarding them as an effective force unless it might be for temporary defensive operations when invaded on our own soil the events of the late war with mexico have not only undeceived them but have removed erroneous impressions which prevailed to some extent even among a portion of our own countrymen that war has demonstrated that upon the breaking out of hostilities not anticipated and for which no previous preparation had been made a volunteer army of citizen soldiers equal to veteran troops and in numbers equal to any emergency can in a short period be brought into the field unlike what would have occurred in any other country we were under no necessity of resorting to drafts or conscriptions on the contrary such was the number of volunteers who patriotically tendered their services that the chief difficulty was in making selections and determining who should be disappointed and compelled to remain at home our citizen soldiers are unlike those drawn from the population of any other country they are composed indiscriminately of all professions and pursuits of farmers lawyers physicians merchants manufacturers mechanics and laborers and this not only among the officers but the private soldiers in the ranks our citizen soldiers are unlike those of any other country in other respects they are armed and have been accustomed from their youth up to handle and use firearms and a large proportion of them especially in the western and more newly settled states are expert marksmen they are men who have a reputation to maintain at home by their good conduct in the field they are intelligent and there is an individuality of character which is found in the ranks of no other army in battle each private man as well as every officer fights not only for his country but for glory and distinction among his fellow citizens when he shall return to civil life the war with mexico has demonstrated not only the ability of the government to organize a numerous army upon a sudden call but also to provide it with all the munitions and necessary supplies with dispatch convenience and ease and to direct its operations with efficiency the strength of our institutions has not only been displayed in the valor and skill of our troops engaged in active service in the field but in the organization of those executive branches which were charged with the general direction and conduct of the war while too great praise cannot be bestowed upon the officers and men who fought our battles 
it would be unjust to withhold from those officers necessarily stationed at home who were charged with the duty of furnishing the army in proper time and at proper places with all the munitions of war and other supplies so necessary to make it efficient the commendation to which they are entitled the credit due to this class of our officers is the greater when it is considered that no army in ancient or modern times was ever better appointed or provided than our army in mexico operating in an enemy's country removed two thousand miles from the seat of the federal government its different corps spread over a vast extent of territory hundreds and even thousands of miles apart from each other nothing short of the untiring vigilance and extraordinary energy of these officers could have enabled them to provide the army at all points and in proper season with all that was required for the most efficient service it is but an act of justice to declare that the officers in charge of the several executive bureaus all under the immediate eye and supervision of the secretary of war performed their respective duties with ability energy and efficiency they have reaped less of the glory of the war not having been personally exposed to its perils in battle than their companions in arms but without their forecast efficient aid and cooperation those in the field would not have been provided with the ample means they possessed for achieving for themselves and their country the unfading honors which they have won for both when all these facts are considered it may cease to be a matter of so much amazement abroad how it happened that our noble army in mexico regulars and volunteers were victorious upon every battlefield however fearful the odds against them the war with mexico has thus fully developed the capacity of republican governments to prosecute successfully a just and necessary foreign war with all the vigor usually attributed to more arbitrary forms of government it has been usual for writers on public law to impute to republics a want of that unity concentration of purpose and vigor of execution which are generally admitted to belong to the monarchical and aristocratic forms and this feature of popular government has been supposed to display itself more particularly in the conduct of a war carried on in an enemy's territory the war with great britain in eighteen twelve was to a great extent confined within our own limits and shed but little light on this subject but the war which we have just closed by an honorable peace evinces beyond all doubt that a popular representative government is equal to any emergency which is likely to arise in the affairs of a nation the war with mexico has developed most strikingly and conspicuously another feature in our institutions it is that without cost to the government or danger to our liberties we have in the bosom of our society of free men available in a just and necessary war virtually a standing army of two million armed citizen soldiers such as fought the battles of mexico but our military strength does not consist alone in our capacity for extended and successful operations on land the navy is an important arm of the national defense if the services of the navy were not so brilliant as those of the army in the late war with mexico it was because they had no enemy to meet on their own element while the army had opportunity of performing more conspicuous service the navy largely participated in the conduct of the war both branches of the service performed their whole duty to the country for the able and gallant services of the officers and men of the navy acting independently as well as in cooperation with our troops in the conquest of the californias the capture of vera cruz and the seizure and occupation of other important positions on the gulf and pacific coasts the highest praises do their vigilance energy and skill rendered the most effective service in excluding munitions of war and other supplies from the enemy while they secured a safe entrance for abundant supplies for our own army our extended commerce was nowhere interrupted and for this immunity from the evils of war the country is indebted to the navy high praise is due to the officers of the several executive bureaus navy yards and stations connected with the service all under the immediate direction of the secretary of the navy for the industry foresight and energy with which everything was directed and furnished to give efficiency to that branch of the service the same vigilance existed in directing the operations of the navy as of the army there was concert of action and of purpose between the heads of the two arms of the service by the orders which were from time to time issued our vessels of war on the pacific and the gulf of mexico were stationed in proper time and in proper positions 
to cooperate efficiently with the army. By this means, their combined power was brought to bear successfully on the enemy. The great results which have been developed and brought to light by this war will be of immeasurable importance in the future progress of our country. They will tend powerfully to preserve us from foreign collisions and to enable us to pursue uninterruptedly our cherished policy of peace with all nations, entangling alliances with none. Occupying, as we do, a more commanding position among nations than at any former period, our duties and our responsibilities to ourselves and to posterity are correspondingly increased. This will be the more obvious when we consider the vast additions which have been recently made to our territorial possessions and their great importance and value. Within less than four years, the annexation of Texas to the Union has been consummated. All conflicting title to the Oregon Territory south of the 49th degree of north latitude, being all that was insisted on by any of my predecessors, has been adjusted, and New Mexico and Upper California have been acquired by treaty. The area of these several territories, according to a report carefully prepared by the Commissioner of the General Land Office from the most authentic information in his possession, and which is herewith transmitted, contains 1,193,061 square miles, or 763,559,040 acres, while the area of the remaining 29 states and the territory not yet organized into states east of the Rocky Mountains contains 2,059,513 square miles, or 1,318,126,058 acres. These estimates show that the territories recently acquired and over which our exclusive jurisdiction and dominion have been extended constitute a country more than half as large as all that which was held by the United States before their acquisition. If Oregon be excluded from the estimate, there will still remain within the limits of Texas, New Mexico, and California 851,598 square miles, or 545,012,720 acres, being in addition equal to more than one-third of all the territory owned by the United States before their acquisition, and, including Oregon, nearly as great an extent of territory as the whole of Europe, Russia only excepted. The Mississippi, so lately the frontier of our country, is now only its center. With the addition of the late acquisitions, the United States are now estimated to be nearly as large as the whole of Europe. It is estimated by the superintendent of the Coast Survey in the accompanying report that the extent of the seacoast of Texas on the Gulf of Mexico is upward of 400 miles, of the coast of Upper California on the Pacific of 970 miles, and of Oregon, including the Straits of Fuca, of 650 miles, making the whole extent of seacoast on the Pacific 1,620 miles, and the whole extent on both the Pacific and the Gulf of Mexico 2,020 miles. The length of the coast on the Atlantic from the northern limits of the United States around the capes of Florida to the Sabine on the eastern boundary of Texas is estimated to be 3,100 miles so that the addition of seacoast, including Oregon, is very nearly two-thirds as great as all we possessed before, and excluding Oregon is an addition of 1,370 miles, being nearly equal to one-half of the extent of coast which we possessed before these acquisitions. We have now three great maritime fronts, on the Atlantic, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Pacific, making in the whole an extent of seacoast exceeding 5,000 miles. This is the extent of the seacoast of the United States, not including bays, sounds, and small irregularities of the main shore and of the sea islands. If these be included, the length of the shoreline of coast, as estimated by the superintendent of the Coast Survey in his report, would be 33,063 miles. It would be difficult to calculate the value of these immense additions to our territorial possessions. Texas, lying contiguous to the western boundary of Louisiana, embracing within its limits a part of the navigable tributary waters of the Mississippi and an extensive seacoast, could not long have remained in the hands of a foreign power without endangering the peace of our southwestern frontier. Her products in the vicinity of the tributaries of the Mississippi must have sought a market through these streams running into and through our territory and the danger of irritation and collision of interests between Texas as a foreign state 
and ourselves would have been imminent while the embarrassments in the commercial intercourse between them must have been constant and unavoidable had texas fallen into the hands or under the influence and control of a strong maritime or military foreign power as she might have done these dangers would have been still greater they have been avoided by her voluntary and peaceful annexation to the united states texas from her position was a natural and almost indispensable part of our territories fortunately she has been restored to our country and now constitutes one of the states of our confederacy upon an equal footing with the original states the salubrity of the climate the fertility of soil peculiarly adapted to the production of some of our most valuable staple commodities and her commercial advantages must soon make her one of our most populous states new mexico though situated in the interior and without a seacoast is known to contain much fertile land to abound in rich mines of the precious metals and to be capable of sustaining a large population from its position it is the intermediate and connecting territory between our settlements and our possessions in texas and those on the pacific coast upper california irrespective of the vast mineral wealth recently developed there holds at this day in point of value and importance to the rest of the union the same relation that louisiana did when that fine territory was acquired from france forty-five years ago extending nearly ten degrees of latitude along the pacific and embracing the only safe and commodious harbors on that coast for many hundred miles with a temperate climate and an extensive interior of fertile lands it is scarcely possible to estimate its wealth until it shall be brought under the government of our laws and its resources fully developed from its position it must command the rich commerce of china of asia of the islands of the pacific of western mexico of central america the south american states and of the russian possessions bordering on that ocean a great emporium will doubtless speedily arise on the californian coast which may be destined to rival in importance new orleans itself the depot of the vast commerce which must exist on the pacific will probably be at some point on the bay of san francisco and will occupy the same relation to the whole western coast of that ocean as new orleans does to the valley of the mississippi and the gulf of mexico to this depot our numerous whale ships will resort with their cargoes to trade refit and obtain supplies this of itself will largely contribute to build up a city which would soon become the centre of a great and rapidly increasing commerce situated on a safe harbour sufficiently capacious for all the navies as well as the marine of the world and convenient to excellent timber for shipbuilding owned by the united states it must become our great western naval depot it was known that mines of the precious metals existed to a considerable extent in california at the time of its acquisition recent discoveries render it probable that these mines are more extensive and valuable than was anticipated the accounts of the abundance of gold in that territory are of such an extraordinary character as would scarcely command belief were they not corroborated by the authentic reports of officers in the public service who have visited the mineral district and derived the facts which they detail from personal observation reluctant to credit the reports in general circulation as to the quantity of gold the officer commanding our forces in california visited the mineral district in july last for the purpose of obtaining accurate information on the subject his report to the war department of the result of his examination and the facts obtained on the spot is herewith laid before congress when he visited the country there were about four thousand persons engaged in collecting gold there is every reason to believe that the number of persons so employed has since been augmented the explorations already made warrant the belief that the supply is very large and that gold is found at various places in an extensive district of country information received from officers of the navy and other sources though not so full and minute confirms the accounts of the commander of our military force in california it appears also from these reports that mines of quicksilver are found in the vicinity of the gold region one of them is now being worked and is believed to be among the most productive in the world the effects produced by the discovery of these rich mineral deposits and the success which has attended the labors of those who have resorted to them have produced a surprising change in the state of affairs in california labor commands a most exorbitant price and all other pursuits but that of searching for the precious metals are abandoned 
nearly the whole of the male population of the country have gone to the gold districts ships arriving on the coast are deserted by their crews and their voyages suspended for want of sailors our commanding officer there entertains apprehensions that soldiers cannot be kept in the public service without a large increase of pay desertions in his command have become frequent and he recommends that those who shall withstand the strong temptation and remain faithful should be rewarded this abundance of gold and the all-engrossing pursuit of it have already caused in california an unprecedented rise in the price of all the necessaries of life that we may the more speedily and fully avail ourselves of the undeveloped wealth of these mines it is deemed of vast importance that a branch of the mint of the united states be authorized to be established at your present session in california among other signal advantages which would result from such an establishment would be that of raising the gold to its par value in that territory a branch mint of the united states at the great commercial depot on the west coast would convert into our own coin not only the gold derived from our own rich mines but also the bullion and specie which our commerce may bring from the whole west coast of central and south america the west coast of america and the adjacent interior embrace the richest and best mines of mexico new granada central america chile and peru the bullion and specie drawn from these countries and especially from those of western mexico and peru to an amount in value of many millions of dollars are now annually diverted and carried by the ships of great britain to her own ports to be recoined or used to sustain her national bank and thus contribute to increase her ability to command so much of the commerce of the world if a branch mint be established at the great commercial point upon that coast a vast amount of bullion and specie would flow thither to be recoined and pass thence to new orleans new york and other atlantic cities the amount of our constitutional currency at home would be greatly increased while its circulation abroad would be promoted it is well known to our merchants trading to china and the west coast of america that great inconvenience and loss are experienced from the fact that our coins are not current at their par value in those countries the powers of europe far removed from the west coast of america by the atlantic ocean which intervenes and by a tedious and dangerous navigation around the southern cape of the continent of america can never successfully compete with the united states in the rich and extensive commerce which is open to us at so much less cost by the acquisition of california the vast importance and commercial advantages of california have heretofore remained undeveloped by the government of the country of which it constituted a part now that this fine province is a part of our country all the states of the union some more immediately and directly than others are deeply interested in the speedy development of its wealth and resources no section of our country is more interested or will be more benefited than the commercial navigating and manufacturing interests of the eastern states our planting and farming interests in every part of the union will be greatly benefited by it as our commerce and navigation are enlarged and extended our exports of agricultural products and of manufactures will be increased and in the new markets thus opened they cannot fail to command remunerating and profitable prices the acquisition of california and new mexico the settlement of the oregon boundary and the annexation of texas extending to the rio grande are results which combined are of greater consequence and will add more to the strength and wealth of the nation than any which have preceded them since the adoption of the constitution but to effect these great results not only california but new mexico must be brought under the control of regularly organized governments the existing condition of california and of that part of new mexico lying west of the rio grande and without the limits of texas imperiously demands that congress should at its present session organize territorial governments over them upon the exchange of ratifications of the treaty of peace with mexico on the thirtieth of may last the temporary governments which had been established over new mexico and california by our military and naval commanders by virtue of the rights of war ceased to derive any obligatory force from that source of authority and having been ceded to the united states all government and control over them under the authority of mexico had ceased to exist impressed with the necessity of establishing territorial governments over them 
I recommended the subject to the favorable consideration of Congress in my message communicating the ratified Treaty of Peace on the 6th of July last, and invoked their action at that session. Congress adjourned without making any provision for their government. The inhabitants, by the transfer of their country, had become entitled to the benefit of our laws and constitution, and yet were left without any regularly organized government. Since that time, the very limited power possessed by the executive has been exercised to preserve and protect them from the inevitable consequences of a state of anarchy. The only government which remained was that established by the military authority during the war. Regarding this to be a de facto government, and that by the presumed consent of the inhabitants it might be continued temporarily, they were advised to conform and submit to it for the short intervening period before Congress would again assemble and could legislate on the subject. The views entertained by the executive on this point are contained in a communication of the Secretary of State dated the 7th of October last, which was forwarded for publication to California and New Mexico, a copy of which is herewith transmitted. The small military force of the regular army, which was serving within the limits of the acquired territories at the close of the war, was retained in them, and additional forces have been ordered there for the protection of the inhabitants and to preserve and secure the rights and interests of the United States. No revenue has been or could be collected at the ports in California, because Congress failed to authorize the establishment of custom houses or the appointment of officers for that purpose. The Secretary of the Treasury, by a circular letter addressed to the collectors of the customs on the seventh day of October last, a copy of which is herewith transmitted, exercised all the power with which he was invested by law. In pursuance of the Act of the 14th of August last, extending the benefit of our post office laws to the people of California, the Postmaster General has appointed two agents, who have proceeded, the one to California and the other to Oregon, with authority to make the necessary arrangements for carrying its provisions into effect. The monthly line of mail steamers from Panama to Astoria has been required to stop and deliver and take mails at San Diego, Monterey, and San Francisco. These mail steamers, connected by the Isthmus of Panama with the line of mail steamers on the Atlantic between New York and Chagres, will establish a regular mail communication with California. It is our solemn duty to provide, with the least practicable delay, for New Mexico and California, regularly organized territorial governments. The causes of the failure to do this at the last session of Congress are well known and deeply to be regretted. With the opening prospects of increased prosperity and national greatness, which the acquisition of these rich and extensive territorial possessions affords, how irrational it would be to forego or to reject these advantages by the agitation of a domestic question which is coeval with the existence of our government itself and to endanger by internal strifes geographical divisions and heated contests for political power or for any other cause the harmony of the glorious union of our confederated states that union which binds us together as one people and which for sixty years has been our shield and protection against every danger in the eyes of the world and of posterity, how trivial and insignificant will be all our internal divisions and struggles compared with the preservation of this union of the states, in all its vigor, and with all its countless blessings. No patriot would foment and excite geographical and sectional divisions. No lover of his country would deliberately calculate the value of the union. Future generations would look in amazement upon the folly of such a course. Other nations at the present day would look upon it with astonishment, and such of them as desire to maintain and perpetuate thrones and monarchical or aristocratical principles will view it with exultation and delight, because in it they will see the elements of faction which they hope must ultimately overturn our system. Ours is the great example of a prosperous and free self-governed republic, commanding the admiration and the imitation of all the lovers of freedom throughout the world. How solemn, therefore, is the duty, how impressive the call upon us and upon all parts of our country, to cultivate a patriotic spirit of harmony, of good fellowship, of compromise and mutual concession, in the administration of the incomparable system of government formed by our fathers in the midst of almost insuperable difficulties. 
and transmitted to us with the injunction that we should enjoy its blessings and hand it down unimpaired to those who may come after us in view of the high and responsible duties which we owe to ourselves and to mankind i trust you may be able at your present session to approach the adjustment of the only domestic question which seriously threatens or probably ever can threaten to disturb the harmony and successful operations of our system the immensely valuable possessions of new mexico and california are already inhabited by a considerable population attracted by their great fertility their mineral wealth their commercial advantages and the salubrity of the climate emigrants from the older states in great numbers are already preparing to seek new homes in these inviting regions shall the dissimilarity of the domestic institutions in the different states prevent us from providing for them suitable governments these institutions existed at the adoption of the constitution but the obstacles which they interposed were overcome by that spirit of compromise which is now invoked in a conflict of opinions or of interests real or imaginary between different sections of our country neither can justly demand all which it might desire to obtain each in the true spirit of our institutions should concede something to the other our gallant forces in the mexican war by whose patriotism and unparalleled deeds of arms we obtained these possessions as an indemnity for our just demands against mexico were composed of citizens who belonged to no one state or section of our union they were men from slaveholding and non-slaveholding states from the north and the south from the east and the west they were all companions in arms and fellow citizens of the same common country engaged in the same common cause when prosecuting that war they were brethren and friends and shared alike with each other common toils dangers and sufferings now when their work is ended when peace is restored and they return again to their homes put off the habiliments of war take their places in society and resume their pursuits in civil life surely a spirit of harmony and concession and of equal regard for the rights of all and of all sections of the union ought to prevail in providing governments for the acquired territories the fruits of their common service the whole people of the united states and of every state contributed to defray the expenses of that war and it would not be just for any one section to exclude another from all participation in the acquired territory this would not be in consonance with the just system of government which the framers of the constitution adopted end of section ten recording by colleen mcmahon section eleven of the state of the union addresses eighteen forty five to eighteen forty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by colleen mcmahon james polk december fifth eighteen forty eight part two the question is believed to be rather abstract than practical whether slavery ever can or would exist in any portion of the acquired territory even if it were left to the option of the slaveholding states themselves from the nature of the climate and productions in much of the larger portion of it it is certain it could never exist and in the remainder the probabilities are it would not but however this may be the question involving as it does a principle of equality of rights in the separate and several states as equal co-partners in the confederacy should not be disregarded in organizing governments over these territories no duty imposed on congress by the constitution requires that they should legislate on the subject of slavery while their power to do so is not only seriously questioned but denied by many of the soundest expounders of that instrument whether congress shall legislate or not the people of the acquired territories when assembled in convention to form state constitutions will possess the sole and exclusive power to determine for themselves whether slavery shall or shall not exist within their limits if congress shall abstain from interfering with the question the people of these territories will be left free to adjust it as they may think proper when they apply for admission as states into the union no enactment of congress could restrain the people of any of the sovereign states of the union old or new north or south slaveholding or non-slaveholding 
from determining the character of their own domestic institutions as they may deem wise and proper any and all of the states possess this right and congress cannot deprive them of it the people of georgia might if they chose so alter their constitution as to abolish slavery within its limits and the people of vermont might so alter their constitution as to admit slavery within its limits both states would possess the right though as all know it is not probable that either would exert it it is fortunate for the peace and harmony of the union that this question is in its nature temporary and can only continue for the brief period which will intervene before california and new mexico may be admitted as states into the union from the tide of population now flowing into them it is highly probable that this will soon occur considering the several states and the citizens of the several states as equals and entitled to equal rights under the constitution if this were an original question it might well be insisted on that the principle of non-interference is the true doctrine and that congress could not in the absence of any express grant of power interfere with their relative rights upon a great emergency however and under menacing dangers to the union the missouri compromise line in respect to slavery was adopted the same line was extended farther west in the acquisition of texas after an acquiescence of nearly thirty years in the principle of compromise recognized and established by these acts and to avoid the danger to the union which might follow if it were now disregarded i have heretofore expressed the opinion that the line of compromise should be extended on the parallel of thirty six thirty from the western boundary of texas where it now terminates to the pacific ocean this is the middle ground of compromise upon which the different sections of the union may meet as they have heretofore met if this be done it is confidently believed a large majority of the people of every section of the country however widely their abstract opinions on the subject of slavery may differ would cheerfully and patriotically acquiesce in it and peace and harmony would again fill our borders the restriction north of the line was only yielded to in the case of missouri and texas upon a principle of compromise made necessary for the sake of preserving the harmony and possibly the existence of the union it was upon these considerations that at the close of your last session i gave my sanction to the principle of the missouri compromise line by approving and signing the bill to establish the territorial government of oregon from a sincere desire to preserve the harmony of the union and in deference for the acts of my predecessors i felt constrained to yield my acquiescence to the extent to which they had gone in compromising this delicate and dangerous question but if congress shall now reverse the decision by which the missouri compromise was effected and shall propose to extend the restriction over the whole territory south as well as north of the parallel of thirty six thirty it will cease to be a compromise and must be regarded as an original question if congress instead of observing the course of non-interference leaving the adoption of their own domestic institutions to the people who may inhabit these territories or if instead of extending the missouri compromise line to the pacific shall prefer to submit the legal and constitutional questions which may arise to the decision of the judicial tribunals as was proposed in a bill which passed the senate at your last session an adjustment may be effected in this mode if the whole subject be referred to the judiciary all parts of the union should cheerfully acquiesce in the final decision of the tribunal created by the constitution for the settlement of all questions which may arise under the constitution treaties and laws of the united states congress is earnestly invoked for the sake of the union its harmony and our continued prosperity as a nation to adjust at its present session this the only dangerous question which lies in our path if not in some one of the modes suggested in some other which may be satisfactory in anticipation of the establishment of regular governments over the acquired territories a joint commission of officers of the army and navy has been ordered to proceed to the coast of california and oregon for the purpose of making reconnaissances and a report as to the proper sites for the erection of fortifications or other defensive works on land and of suitable situations for naval stations the information which may be expected from a scientific and skilful examination of the whole face of the coast 
will be eminently useful to Congress when they come to consider the propriety of making appropriations for these great national objects. Proper defenses on land will be necessary for the security and protection of our possessions, and the establishment of navy yards and a dock for the repair and construction of vessels will be important alike to our navy and commercial marine. Without such establishments, every vessel, whether of the navy or of the merchant service, requiring repair, must at great expense come round Cape Horn to one of our Atlantic yards for that purpose. With such establishments, vessels, it is believed, may be built or repaired as cheaply in California as upon the Atlantic coast. They would give employment to many of our enterprising shipbuilders and mechanics, and greatly facilitate and enlarge our commerce in the Pacific. As it is ascertained that mines of gold, silver, copper, and quicksilver exist in New Mexico and California, and that nearly all the lands where they are found belong to the United States, it is deemed important to the public interest that provision be made for a geological and mineralogical examination of these regions. Measures should be adopted to preserve the mineral lands, especially such as contain the precious metals, for the use of the United States or, if brought into market, to separate them from the farming lands, and dispose of them in such a manner as to secure a large return of money to the treasury, and at the same time to lead to the development of their wealth by individual proprietors and purchasers. To do this, it will be necessary to provide for an immediate survey and location of the lots. If Congress should deem it proper to dispose of the mineral lands, they should be sold in small quantities and at a fixed minimum price. I recommend that Surveyors General's offices be authorized to be established in New Mexico and California, and provision made for surveying and bringing the public lands into market at the earliest practicable period. In disposing of these lands, I recommend that the right of preemption be secured, and liberal grants made to the early emigrants who have settled or may settle upon them. It will be important to extend our revenue laws over these territories, and especially over California, at an early period. There is already a considerable commerce with California, and until ports of entry shall be established and collectors appointed, no revenue can be received. If these and other necessary and proper measures be adopted for the development of the wealth and resources of New Mexico and California, and regular territorial governments be established over them, such will probably be the rapid enlargement of our commerce and navigation and such the addition to the national wealth, that the present generation may live to witness the controlling commercial and monetary power of the world transferred from London and other European emporiums to the city of New York. The apprehensions which were entertained by some of our statesmen in the earlier periods of the government, that our system was incapable of operating with sufficient energy and success over largely extended territorial limits, and that if this were attempted it would fall to pieces by its own weakness, have been dissipated by our experience. By the division of power between the states and federal government, the latter is found to operate with as much energy in the extremes as in the center. It is as efficient in the remotest of the thirty states which now compose the Union, as it was in the thirteen states which formed our Constitution. Indeed, it may well be doubted whether, if our present population had been confined within the limits of the original thirteen states, the tendencies to centralization and consolidation would not have been such as to have encroached upon the essential reserved rights of the states, and thus to have made the federal government a widely different one, practically, from what it is in theory and was intended to be by its framers. So far from entertaining apprehensions of the safety of our system by the extension of our territory, the belief is confidently entertained that each new state gives strength and an additional guarantee for the preservation of the Union itself. In pursuance of the provisions of the 13th Article of the Treaty of Peace, Friendship, Limits, and Settlement with the Republic of Mexico, and of the Act of July 29, 1848, Claims of our citizens, which had been already liquidated and decided against the Mexican Republic, amounting with the interest thereon to two million twenty three thousand eight hundred and thirty two dollars and fifty one cents, have been liquidated and paid. There remain to be paid of these claims seventy four thousand one hundred and ninety two dollars and twenty six cents. 
congress at its last session having made no provision for executing the fifteenth article of the treaty by which the united states assume to make satisfaction for the unliquidated claims of our citizens against mexico to an amount not exceeding three and a quarter millions of dollars the subject is again recommended to your favorable consideration the exchange of ratifications of the treaty with mexico took place on the thirtieth of may eighteen forty eight within one year after that time the commissioner and surveyor which each government stipulates to appoint are required to meet at the port of san diego and proceed to run and mark the said boundary in its whole course to the mouth of the rio bravo del norte it will be seen from this provision that the period within which a commissioner and surveyor of the respective governments are to meet at san diego will expire on the thirtieth of may eighteen forty nine Congress, at the close of its last session, made an appropriation for the expenses of running and marking the boundary line between the two countries, but did not fix the amount of salary which should be paid to the commissioner and surveyor to be appointed on the part of the United States. It is desirable that the amount of compensation which they shall receive should be prescribed by law and not left, as at present, to executive discretion. Measures were adopted at the earliest practicable period to organize the territorial government of Oregon, as authorized by the Act of the 14th of August last. The governor and marshal of the territory, accompanied by a small military escort, left at the frontier of Missouri in September last and took the southern route by the way of Santa Fe and the River Gila to California, with the intention of proceeding thence in one of our vessels of war to their destination. The governor was fully advised of the great importance of his early arrival in the country, and it is confidently believed he may reach Oregon in the latter part of the present month, or early in the next. The other officers for the territory have proceeded by sea. In the month of May last, I communicated information to Congress that an Indian war had broken out in Oregon, and recommended that authority be given to raise an adequate number of volunteers to proceed without delay to the assistance of our fellow citizens in that territory the authority to raise such a force not having been granted by congress as soon as their services could be dispensed with in mexico orders were issued to the regiment of mounted riflemen to proceed to jefferson barracks in missouri and to prepare to march to oregon as soon as the necessary provision could be made shortly before it was ready to march it was arrested by the provision of the act passed by congress on the last day of the last session which directed that all the non-commissioned officers musicians and privates of that regiment who had been in service in mexico should upon their application be entitled to be discharged the effect of this provision was to disband the rank and file of the regiment and before their places could be filled by recruits the season had so far advanced that it was impracticable for it to proceed until the opening of the next spring. In the month of October last, the accompanying communication was received from the governor of the temporary government of Oregon, giving information of the continuance of the Indian disturbances and of the destitution and defenseless condition of the inhabitants. Orders were immediately transmitted to the commander of our squadron in the Pacific, to dispatch to their assistance a part of the naval forces on that station, to furnish them with arms and ammunition, and to continue to give them such aid and protection as the Navy could afford, until the Army could reach the country. It is the policy of humanity, and one which has always been pursued by the United States, to cultivate the good will of the aboriginal tribes of this continent, and to restrain them from making war and indulging in excesses by mild means rather than by force that this could have been done with the tribes in oregon had that territory been brought under the government of our laws at an earlier period and had other suitable measures been adopted by congress such as now exist in our intercourse with the other indian tribes within our limits cannot be doubted indeed the immediate and only cause of the existing hostility of the indians of oregon is represented to have been the long delay of the united states in making to them some trifling compensation in such articles as they wanted for the country now occupied by our emigrants which the indians claimed and over which they formerly roamed this compensation had been promised to them by the temporary government established in oregon but its fulfillment had been postponed from time to time for nearly two years whilst those who made it had been anxiously waiting for congress to establish a territorial government over the country 
the indians became at length distrustful of their good faith and sought redress by plunder and massacre which finally led to the present difficulties a few thousand dollars in suitable presents as a compensation for the country which had been taken possession of by our citizens would have satisfied the indians and have prevented the war a small amount properly distributed it is confidently believed would soon restore quiet in this indian war our fellow citizens of oregon have been compelled to take the field in their own defense have performed valuable military services and been subjected to expenses which have fallen heavily upon them justice demands that provision should be made by congress to compensate them for their services and to refund to them the necessary expenses which they have incurred i repeat the recommendation heretofore made to congress that provision be made for the appointment of a suitable number of indian agents to reside among the tribes of oregon and that a small sum be appropriated to enable these agents to cultivate friendly relations with them if this be done the presence of a small military force will be all that is necessary to keep them in check and preserve peace i recommend that similar provisions be made as regards the tribes inhabiting northern texas new mexico california and the extensive region lying between our settlements in missouri and these possessions as the most effective means of preserving peace upon our borders and within the recently acquired territories the secretary of the treasury will present in his annual report a highly satisfactory statement of the condition of the finances the imports for the fiscal year ending on the thirtieth of june last were of the value of one hundred and fifty four million nine hundred and seventy seven thousand eight hundred and seventy six dollars of which the amount exported was twenty one million one hundred and twenty eight thousand and ten dollars leaving one hundred and thirty three million eight hundred and forty nine thousand eight hundred and sixty six dollars in the country for domestic use the value of the exports for the same period was one hundred and fifty four million thirty two thousand one hundred and thirty one dollars consisting of domestic productions amounting to one hundred and thirty two million nine hundred and four thousand one hundred and twenty one dollars and twenty one million one hundred and twenty eight thousand and ten dollars of foreign articles the receipts into the treasury for the same period exclusive of loans amounted to thirty five million four hundred and thirty six thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars and fifty nine cents of which there was derived from customs thirty one million seven hundred and fifty seven thousand seventy dollars and ninety six cents from sales of public lands three million three hundred and twenty eight thousand six hundred and forty two dollars and fifty six cents and from miscellaneous and incidental sources three hundred and fifty one thousand and thirty seven dollars and seven cents it will be perceived that the revenue from customs for the last fiscal year exceeded by seven hundred and fifty seven thousand and seventy dollars and ninety six cents the estimate of the secretary of the treasury in his last annual report and that the aggregate receipts during the same period from customs lands and miscellaneous sources also exceeded the estimate by the sum of five hundred and thirty six thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars and fifty nine cents indicating however a very near approach in the estimate to the actual result the expenditures during the fiscal year ending on the thirtieth of june last including those for the war and exclusive of payments of principal and interest for the public debt were forty two million eight hundred and eleven thousand nine hundred and seventy dollars and three cents it is estimated that the receipts into the treasury for the fiscal year ending on the thirtieth of june eighteen forty nine including the balance in the treasury on the first of july last will amount to the sum of fifty seven million forty eight thousand nine hundred and sixty nine dollars and ninety cents of which thirty two million dollars it is estimated will be derived from customs three million dollars from the sales of the public lands and one million two hundred thousand dollars from miscellaneous and incidental sources including the premium upon the loan and the amount paid and to be paid into the treasury on account of military contributions in mexico and the sale of arms and vessels and other public property rendered unnecessary for the use of the government by the termination of the war and twenty million six hundred ninety five thousand four hundred thirty five dollars and thirty cents from loans already negotiated including treasury notes funded which together with the balance in the treasury on the first of july last make the sum estimated the expenditures for the same period including the necessary payment on account of the principal and interest of the public debt 
and the principal and interest of the first installment due to mexico on the thirtieth of may next and other expenditures growing out of the war to be paid during the present year will amount including the reimbursement of treasury notes to the sum of fifty four million one hundred ninety five thousand two hundred and seventy five dollars and six cents leaving an estimated balance in the treasury on the first of july eighteen forty nine of two million eight hundred and fifty three thousand six hundred and ninety four dollars and eighty four cents the secretary of the treasury will present as required by law the estimate of the receipts and expenditures for the next fiscal year the expenditures as estimated for that year are thirty three million two hundred and thirteen thousand one hundred and fifty two dollars and seventy three cents including three million seven hundred and ninety nine thousand one hundred and two dollars and eighteen cents for the interest on the public debt and three million five hundred and forty thousand dollars for the principal and interest due to mexico on the thirtieth of may eighteen fifty leaving the sum of twenty five million eight hundred and seventy four thousand fifty dollars and thirty five cents which it is believed will be ample for the ordinary peace expenditures the operations of the tariff act of eighteen forty six have been such during the past year as to fully meet the public expectation and to confirm the opinion heretofore expressed of the wisdom of the change in our revenue system which was effected by it the receipts under it into the treasury for the first fiscal year after its enactment exceeded by the sum of five million forty four thousand four hundred and three dollars and nine cents the amount collected during the last fiscal year under the tariff act of eighteen forty two ending the thirtieth of june eighteen forty six the total revenue realized from the commencement of its operation on the first of december eighteen forty six until the close of the last quarter on the thirtieth of september last being twenty two months was fifty six million six hundred and fifty four thousand five hundred and sixty three dollars and seventy nine cents being a much larger sum than was ever before received from duties during any equal period under the tariff acts of eighteen twenty four eighteen twenty eight eighteen thirty two and eighteen forty two whilst by the repeal of highly protective and prohibitory duties the revenue has been increased the taxes on the people have been diminished they have been relieved from the heavy amounts with which they were burthened under former laws in the form of increased prices or bounties paid to favored classes and pursuits the predictions which were made that the tariff act of eighteen forty six would reduce the amount of revenue below that collected under the act of eighteen forty two and would prostrate the business and destroy the prosperity of the country have not been verified with an increased and increasing revenue the finances are in a highly flourishing condition agriculture commerce and navigation are prosperous the prices of manufactured fabrics and of other products are much less injuriously affected than was to have been anticipated from the unprecedented revulsions during which the last and the present year have overwhelmed the industry and paralyzed the credit and commerce of so many great and enlightened nations of europe severe commercial revulsions abroad have always heretofore operated to depress and often to affect disastrously almost every branch of american industry the temporary depression of a portion of our manufacturing interests is the effect of foreign causes and is far less severe than has prevailed on all former similar occasions it is believed that looking to the great aggregate of all our interests the whole country was never more prosperous than at the present period and never more rapidly advancing in wealth and population neither the foreign war in which we have been involved nor the loans which have absorbed so large a portion of our capital nor the commercial revulsion in great britain in eighteen forty seven nor the paralysis of credit and commerce throughout europe in eighteen forty eight have affected injuriously to any considerable extent any of the great interests of the country or arrested our onward march to greatness wealth and power had the disturbances in europe not occurred our commerce would undoubtedly have been still more extended and would have added still more to the national wealth and public prosperity but notwithstanding these disturbances the operations of the revenue system established by the tariff act of eighteen forty six have been so generally beneficial to the government and the business of the country that no change in its provisions is demanded by a wise public policy and none is recommended the operations of the constitutional treasury established by the act of the sixth of august eighteen forty six 
in the receipt custody and disbursement of the public money have continued to be successful under this system the public finances have been carried through a foreign war involving the necessity of loans and extraordinary expenditures and requiring distant transfers and disbursements without embarrassment and no loss has occurred of any of the public money deposited under its provisions whilst it has proved to be safe and useful to the government its effects have been most beneficial upon the business of the country it has tended powerfully to secure an exemption from that inflation and fluctuation of the paper currency so injurious to domestic industry and rendering so uncertain the rewards of labor and it is believed has largely contributed to preserve the whole country from a serious commercial revulsion such as often occurred under the bank deposit system in the year eighteen forty seven there was a revulsion in the business of great britain of great extent and intensity which was followed by failures in that kingdom unprecedented in number and amount of losses this is believed to be the first instance when such disastrous bankruptcies occurring in a country with which we have such extensive commerce produced little or no injurious effect upon our trade or currency we remain but little affected in our money market and our business and industry were still prosperous and progressive during the present year the whole continent of europe has been convulsed by civil war and revolutions attended by numerous bankruptcies by an unprecedented fall in their public securities and an almost universal paralysis of commerce and industry and yet although our trade and the prices of our products must have been somewhat unfavorably affected by these causes we have escaped a revulsion our money market is comparatively easy and public and private credit have advanced and improved it is confidently believed that we have been saved from their effect by the salutary operation of the constitutional treasury it is certain that if the twenty four millions of specie imported into the country during the fiscal year ending on the thirtieth of june eighteen forty seven had gone into the banks as to a great extent it must have done it would in the absence of this system have been made the basis of augmented bank paper issues probably to an amount not less than sixty million dollars or seventy million dollars producing as an inevitable consequence of an inflated currency extravagant prices for a time and wild speculation which must have been followed on the reflux to europe the succeeding year of so much of that specie by the prostration of the business of the country the suspension of the banks and most extensive bankruptcies occurring as this would have done at a period when the country was engaged in a foreign war when considerable loans of specie were required for distant disbursements and when the banks the fiscal agents of the government and the depositories of its money were suspended the public credit must have sunk and many millions of dollars as was the case during the war of eighteen twelve must have been sacrificed in discounts upon loans and upon the depreciated paper currency which the government would have been compelled to use under the operations of the constitutional treasury not a dollar has been lost by the depreciation of the currency the loans required to prosecute the war with mexico were negotiated by the secretary of the treasury above par realizing a large premium to the government the restraining effect of the system upon the tendencies to excessive paper issues by banks has saved the government from heavy losses and thousands of our businessmen from bankruptcy and ruin the wisdom of the system has been tested by the experience of the last two years and it is the dictate of sound policy that it should remain undisturbed the modifications in some of the details of this measure involving none of its essential principles heretofore recommended are again presented for your favorable consideration in my message of the sixth of july last transmitting to congress the ratified treaty of peace with mexico i recommended the adoption of measures for the speedy payment of the public debt in reiterating that recommendation i refer you to the considerations presented in that message in its support the public debt including that authorized to be negotiated in pursuance of existing laws and including treasury notes amounted at that time to sixty five million seven hundred and seventy eight thousand four hundred and fifty dollars and forty one cents funded stock of the united states amounting to about half a million dollars has been purchased as authorized by law since that period and the public debt has thus been reduced 
the details of which will be presented in the annual report of the Secretary of the Treasury. The estimates of expenditures for the next fiscal year, submitted by the Secretary of the Treasury, it is believed will be ample for all necessary purposes. If the appropriations made by Congress shall not exceed the amount estimated, the means in the Treasury will be sufficient to defray all the expenses of the government, to pay off the next installment of $3 million to Mexico, which will fall due on the 30th of May next, and still a considerable surplus will remain, which should be applied to the further purchase of the public stock and reduction of the debt. Should enlarged appropriations be made, the necessary consequence will be to postpone the payment of the debt. Though our debt, as compared with that of most other nations, is small, it is our true policy, and in harmony with the genius of our institutions, that we should present to the world the rare spectacle of a great republic possessing vast resources and wealth, wholly exempt from public indebtedness. This would add still more to our strength, and give to us a still more commanding position among the nations of the earth. The public expenditures should be economical and be confined to such necessary objects as are clearly within the powers of Congress. All such as are not absolutely demanded should be postponed, and the payment of the public debt at the earliest practicable period should be a cardinal principle of our public policy. For the reason assigned in my last annual message, I repeat the recommendation that a branch of the Mint of the United States be established at the City of New York. The importance of this measure is greatly increased by the acquisition of the rich mines of the precious metals in New Mexico and California, and especially in the latter. I repeat the recommendation heretofore made in favor of the graduation and reduction of the price of such of the public lands as have been long offered in the market and have remained unsold, and in favor of extending the rights of preemption to actual settlers on the unsurveyed as well as the surveyed lands. End of section 11. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 12 of State of the Union Addresses, 1845 to 1848. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. James Polk. December 5, 1848, Part 3. The condition and operations of the Army and the state of other branches of the public service under the supervision of the War Department are satisfactorily presented in the accompanying report of the Secretary of War. On the return of peace, our forces were withdrawn from Mexico, and the volunteers and that portion of the regular Army engaged for the war were disbanded. Orders have been issued for stationing the forces of our permanent establishment at various positions in our extended country where troops may be required. Owing to the remoteness of some of these positions, the detachments have not yet reached their destination. Notwithstanding the extension of the limits of our country and the forces required in the new territories, it is confidently believed that our present military establishment is sufficient for all exigencies so long as our peaceful relations remain undisturbed. Of the amount of military contributions collected in Mexico, the sum of $769,650 was applied toward the payment of the first installment due under the treaty with Mexico. The further sum of $346,369.30 has been paid into the Treasury and unexpended balances still remain in the hands of dispersing officers and those who were engaged in the collection of these monies. After the proclamation of peace, no further disbursements were made of any unexpended monies arising from this source. The balances on hand were directed to be paid into the Treasury, and individual claims on the fund will remain unadjusted until Congress shall authorize their settlement and payment. These claims are not considerable in number or amount. I recommend to your favorable consideration the suggestions of the Secretary of War and the Secretary of the Navy in regard to legislation on this subject. Our Indian relations are presented in a most favorable view in the report from the War Department. The wisdom of our policy in regard to the tribes within our limits is clearly manifested by their improved and rapidly improving condition. 
a most important treaty with the menominees has been recently negotiated by the commissioner of indian affairs in person by which all their land in the state of wisconsin being about four million acres has been ceded to the united states this treaty will be submitted to the senate for ratification at an early period of your present session within the last four years eight important treaties have been negotiated with different indian tribes and at a cost of one million eight hundred and forty two thousand dollars indian lands to the amount of more than eighteen million five hundred thousand acres have been ceded to the united states and provision has been made for settling in the country west of the mississippi the tribes which occupied this large extent of the public domain the title to all the indian lands within the several states of our union with the exception of a few small reservations is now extinguished and a vast region opened for settlement and cultivation the accompanying report of the secretary of the navy gives a satisfactory exhibit of the operations and condition of that branch of the public service a number of small vessels suitable for entering the mouths of rivers were judiciously purchased during the war and gave great efficiency to the squadron in the gulf of mexico on the return of peace when no longer valuable for naval purposes and liable to constant deterioration they were sold and the money placed in the treasury the number of men in the naval service authorized by law during the war has been reduced by discharges below the maximum fixed for the peace establishment adequate squadrons are maintained in the several quarters of the globe where experience has shown their services may be most usefully employed and the naval service was never in a condition of higher discipline or greater efficiency I invite attention to the recommendation of the Secretary of the Navy on the subject of the Marine Corps. The reduction of the Corps at the end of the war required that four officers of each of the three lower grades should be dropped from the rolls. A board of officers made the selection, and those designated were necessarily dismissed, but without any alleged fault. I concur in opinion with the Secretary that the service would be improved by reducing the number of landsmen and increasing the Marines such a measure would justify an increase of the number of officers to the extent of the reduction by dismissal and still the corps would have fewer officers than a corresponding number of men in the army the contracts for the transportation of the mail and steamships convertible into war steamers promised to realize all the benefits to our commerce and to the navy which were anticipated the first steamer thus secured to the government was launched in january eighteen forty seven there are now seven and in another year there will probably be not less than seventeen afloat while this great national advantage is secured our social and commercial intercourse is increased and promoted with germany great britain and other parts of europe with all the countries on the west coast of our continent especially with oregon and california and between the northern and southern sections of the united states considerable revenue may be expected from postages but the connected line from New York to Chagres and thence across the Isthmus to Oregon cannot fail to exert a beneficial influence, not now to be estimated, on the interests of the manufactures, commerce, navigation, and currency of the United States. As an important part of the system, I recommend to your favorable consideration the establishment of the proposed line of steamers between New Orleans and Vera Cruz it promises the most happy results in cementing friendship between the two republics and extending reciprocal benefits to the trade and manufactures of both the report of the postmaster general will make known to you the operations of that department for the past year it is gratifying to find the revenues of the department under the rates of postage now established by law so rapidly increasing the gross amount of postages during the last fiscal year amounted to four million three hundred and seventy one thousand and seventy seven dollars exceeding the annual average received for the nine years immediately preceding the passage of the act of the third of march eighteen forty five by the sum of six thousand four hundred and fifty three dollars and exceeding the amount received for the year ending the thirtieth of june eighteen forty seven by the sum of four hundred and twenty five thousand one hundred and eighty four dollars the expenditures for the year excluding the sum of ninety four thousand six hundred and seventy two dollars 
allowed by Congress at its last session to individual claimants, and including the sum of $100,500 paid for the services of the line of steamers between Bremen and New York, amounted to $4,198,845, which is less than the annual average for the nine years previous to the Act of 1845 by $300,748. The mail routes on the 30th day of June last were 163,208 miles in extent, being an increase during the last year of 9,390 miles. The mails were transported over them during the same time 41,012,579 miles, making an increase of transportation for the year of 2,124,680 miles, whilst the expense was less than that of the previous year, by $4,235. The increase in the mail transportation within the last three years has been 5,378,310 miles, whilst the expenses were reduced $456,738, making an increase of service at the rate of 15% and a reduction in the expenses of more than 15%. During the past year, there have been employed, under contracts with the Post Office Department, two ocean steamers in conveying the mails monthly between New York and Bremen, and one, since October last, performing semi-monthly service between Charleston and Havana, and a contract has been made for the transportation of the Pacific mails across the Isthmus from Chagres to Panama. Under the authority given to the Secretary of the Navy, Three ocean steamers have been constructed and sent to the Pacific, and are expected to enter upon the mail service between Panama and Oregon and the intermediate ports on the 1st of January next, and a fourth has been engaged by him for the service between Havana and Chagres, so that a regular monthly mail line will be kept up after that time between the United States and our territories on the Pacific. Notwithstanding this great increase in the mail service, should the revenue continue to increase the present year as it did in the last, there will be received near $450,000 more than the expenditures. These considerations have satisfied the Postmaster General that with certain modifications of the Act of 1845, the revenue may be still further increased and a reduction of postages made to a uniform rate of five cents without an interference with the principal which has been constantly and properly enforced, of making that department sustain itself. A well-digested, cheap postage system is the best means of diffusing intelligence among the people, and is of so much importance in a country so extensive as that of the United States, that I recommend to your favorable consideration the suggestions of the Postmaster General for its improvement. Nothing can retard the onward progress of our country and prevent us from assuming and maintaining the first rank among nations, but a disregard of the experience of the past and a recurrence to an unwise public policy. We have just closed a foreign war by an honorable peace, a war rendered necessary and unavoidable in vindication of the national rights and honor. The present condition of the country is similar in some respects to that which existed immediately after the close of the war with Great Britain in 1815, and the occasion is deemed to be a proper one to take a retrospect of the measures of public policy which followed that war. There was at that period of our history a departure from our earlier policy. The enlargement of the powers of the federal government by construction, which obtained, was not warranted by any just interpretation of the Constitution. A few years after the close of that war, a series of measures was adopted which, united and combined, constituted what was termed by their authors and advocates the American system. The introduction of the new policy was for a time favored by the condition of the country, by the heavy debt which had been contracted during the war, by the depression of the public credit, by the deranged state of the finances and the currency, and by the commercial and pecuniary embarrassment which extensively prevailed. These were not the only causes which led to its establishment. The events of the war with Great Britain, and the embarrassments which had attended its prosecution, had left on the minds of many of our statesmen the impression that our government was not strong enough, 
and that to wield its resources successfully in great emergencies and especially in war more power should be concentrated in its hands this increased power they did not seek to obtain by the legitimate and prescribed mode an amendment of the constitution but by construction they saw governments in the old world based upon different orders of society and so constituted as to throw the whole power of nations into the hands of a few who taxed and controlled the many without responsibility or restraint in that arrangement they conceived the strength of nations in war consisted there was also something fascinating in the ease luxury and display of the higher orders who drew their wealth from the toil of the laboring millions the authors of the system drew their ideas of political economy from what they had witnessed in europe and particularly in great britain they had viewed the enormous wealth concentrated in few hands and had seen the splendor of the overgrown establishments of an aristocracy which was upheld by the restrictive policy they forgot to look down upon the poorer classes of the english population upon whose daily and yearly labor the great establishments they so much admired were sustained and supported they failed to perceive that the scantily fed and half-clad operatives were not only in abject poverty but were bound in chains of oppressive servitude for the benefit of the favored classes who were the exclusive objects of the care of the government it was not possible to reconstruct society in the united states upon the european plan here there was a written constitution by which orders and titles were not recognized or tolerated a system of measures was therefore devised calculated if not intended to withdraw power gradually and silently from the states and the mass of the people and by construction to approximate our government to the european models substituting an aristocracy of wealth for that of orders and titles without reflecting upon the dissimilarity of our institutions and of the condition of our people and those of europe they conceived the vain idea of building up in the united states a system similar to that which they admired abroad great britain had a national bank of large capital in whose hands was concentrated the controlling monetary and financial power of the nation an institution wielding almost kingly power and exerting vast influence upon all the operations of trade and upon the policy of the government itself great britain had an enormous public debt and it had become a part of her public policy to regard this as a public blessing great britain had also a restrictive policy which placed fetters and burdens on trade and trammelled the productive industry of the mass of the nation by her combined system of policy the landlords and other property holders were protected and enriched by the enormous taxes which were levied upon the labor of the country for their advantage imitating this foreign policy the first step in establishing the new system in the united states was the creation of a national bank not foreseeing the dangerous power and countless evils which such an institution might entail on the country nor perceiving the connection which it was designed to form between the bank and the other branches of the miscalled american system but feeling the embarrassments of the treasury and of the business of the country consequent upon the war some of our statesmen who had held different and sounder views were induced to yield their scruples and indeed settled convictions of its unconstitutionality and to give it their sanction as an expedient which they vainly hoped might produce relief it was a most unfortunate error as the subsequent history and final catastrophe of that dangerous and corrupt institution have abundantly proved the bank with its numerous branches ramified into the states soon brought many of the active political and commercial men in different sections of the country into the relation of debtors to it and dependents upon it for pecuniary favors thus diffusing throughout the mass of society a great number of individuals of power and influence to give tone to public opinion and to act in concert in cases of emergency the corrupt power of such a political engine is no longer a matter of speculation having been displayed in numerous instances but most signally in the political struggles of eighteen thirty two eighteen thirty three and eighteen thirty four in opposition to the public will represented by a fearless and patriotic president but the bank was but one branch of the new system a public debt of more than one hundred and twenty million dollars existed 
and it is not to be disguised that many of the authors of the new system did not regard its speedy payment as essential to the public prosperity but looked upon its continuance as no national evil whilst the debt existed it furnished aliment to the national bank and rendered increased taxation necessary to the amount of the interest exceeding seven million dollars annually this operated in harmony with the next branch of the new system which was a high protective tariff this was to afford bounties to favored classes and particular pursuits at the expense of all others a proposition to tax the whole people for the purpose of enriching a few was too monstrous to be openly made the scheme was therefore veiled under the plausible but delusive pretext of a measure to protect home industry and many of our people were for a time led to believe that a tax which in the main fell upon labor was for the benefit of the laborer who paid it this branch of the system involved a partnership between the government and the favored classes the former receiving the proceeds of the tax imposed on articles imported and the latter the increased price of similar articles produced at home caused by such tax it is obvious that the portion to be received by the favored classes would as a general rule be increased in proportion to the increase of the rates of tax imposed and diminished as those rates were reduced to the revenue standard required by the wants of the government the rates required to produce a sufficient revenue for the ordinary expenditures of government for necessary purposes were not likely to give to the private partners in this scheme profits sufficient to satisfy their cupidity and hence a variety of expedients and pretexts were resorted to for the purpose of enlarging the expenditures and thereby creating a necessity for keeping up a high protective tariff the effect of this policy was to interpose artificial restrictions upon the natural course of the business and trade of the country and to advance the interests of large capitalists and monopolists at the expense of the great mass of the people who were taxed to increase their wealth another branch of this system was a comprehensive scheme of internal improvements capable of indefinite enlargement and sufficient to swallow up as many millions annually as could be exacted from the foreign commerce of the country this was a convenient and necessary adjunct of the protective tariff it was to be the great absorbent of any surplus which might at any time accumulate in the treasury and of the taxes levied on the people not for necessary revenue purposes but for the avowed object of affording protection to the favored classes auxiliary to the same end if it was not an essential part of the system itself was the scheme which at a later period obtained for distributing the proceeds of the sales of the public lands among the states other expedients were devised to take money out of the treasury and prevent its coming in from any other source than the protective tariff the authors and supporters of the system were the advocates of the largest expenditures whether for necessary or useful purposes or not because the larger the expenditures the greater was the pretext for high taxes in the form of protective duties these several measures were sustained by popular names and plausible arguments by which thousands were deluded the bank was represented to be an indispensable fiscal agent for the government was to equalize exchanges and to regulate and furnish a sound currency always and everywhere of uniform value the protective tariff was to give employment to american labor at advanced prices was to protect home industry and furnish a steady market for the farmer internal improvements were to bring trade into every neighborhood and enhance the value of every man's property the distribution of the land money was to enrich the states finish their public works plant schools throughout their borders and relieve them from taxation but the fact that for every dollar taken out of the treasury for these objects a much larger sum was transferred from the pockets of the people to the favored classes was carefully concealed as was also the tendency if not the ultimate design of the system to build up an aristocracy of wealth to control the masses of society and monopolize the political power of the country the several branches of this system were so intimately blended together that in their operation each sustained and strengthened the others their joint operation was to add new burthens of taxation and to encourage a largely increased and wasteful expenditure of public money it was the interest of the bank 
that the revenue collected and the disbursements made by the government should be large because being the depository of the public money the larger the amount the greater would be the bank profits by its use it was the interest of the favored classes who were enriched by the protective tariff to have the rates of that protection as high as possible for the higher those rates the greater would be their advantage it was the interest of the people of all those sections and localities who expected to be benefited by expenditures for internal improvements that the amount collected should be as large as possible to the end that the sum dispersed might also be the larger the states being the beneficiaries in the distribution of the land money had an interest in having the rates of tax imposed by the protective tariff large enough to yield a sufficient revenue from that source to meet the wants of the government without disturbing or taking from them the land fund so that each of the branches constituting the system had a common interest in swelling the public expenditures they had a direct interest in maintaining the public debt unpaid and increasing its amount because this would produce an annual increased drain upon the treasury to the amount of the interest and render augmented taxes necessary the operation and necessary effect of the whole system were to encourage large and extravagant expenditures and thereby to increase the public patronage and maintain a rich and splendid government at the expense of a taxed and impoverished people it is manifest that this scheme of enlarged taxation and expenditures had it continued to prevail must soon have converted the government of the union intended by its framers to be a plain cheap and simple confederation of states united together for common protection and charged with a few specific duties relating chiefly to our foreign affairs into a consolidated empire depriving the states of their reserved rights and the people of their just power and control in the administration of their government in this manner the whole form and character of the government would be changed not by an amendment of the constitution but by resorting to an unwarrantable and unauthorized construction of that instrument the indirect mode of levying the taxes by a duty on imports prevents the mass of the people from readily perceiving the amount they pay and has enabled the few who are thus enriched and who seek to wield the political power of the country to deceive and delude them were the taxes collected by a direct levy upon the people as is the case in the states this could not occur the whole system was resisted from its inception by many of our ablest statesmen some of whom doubted its constitutionality and its expediency while others believed it was in all its branches a flagrant and dangerous infraction of the constitution that a national bank a protective tariff levied not to raise the revenue needed but for protection merely internal improvements and the distribution of the proceeds of the sale of the public lands are measures without the warrant of the constitution would upon the maturest consideration seem to be clear it is remarkable that no one of these measures involving such momentous consequences is authorized by any express grant of power in the constitution not one of them is incident to as being necessary and proper for the execution of the specific powers granted by the constitution the authority under which it has been attempted to justify each of them is derived from inferences and constructions of the constitution which its letter and its whole object and design do not warrant is it to be conceived that such immense powers would have been left by the framers of the constitution to mere inferences and doubtful constructions had it been intended to confer them on the federal government it is but reasonable to conclude that it would have been done by plain and unequivocal grants this was not done but the whole structure of which the american system consisted was reared on no other or better foundation than forced implications and inferences of power which its authors assumed might be deduced by construction from the constitution but it has been urged that the national bank which constituted so essential a branch of this combined system of measures was not a new measure and that its constitutionality had been previously sanctioned because a bank had been chartered in seventeen ninety one and had received the official signature of president washington a few facts will show the just weight to which this precedent should be entitled as bearing upon the question of constitutionality great division of opinion upon the subject existed in congress 
it is well known that president washington entertained serious doubts both as to the constitutionality and expediency of the measure and while the bill was before him for his official approval or disapproval so great were these doubts that he required the opinion in writing of the members of his cabinet to aid him in arriving at a decision his cabinet gave their opinions and were divided upon the subject general hamilton being in favor of and mr jefferson and mr randolph being opposed to the constitutionality and expediency of the bank it is well known also that president washington retained the bill from monday the fourteenth when it was presented to him until friday the twenty fifth of february being the last moment permitted him by the constitution to deliberate when he finally yielded to it his reluctant assent and gave it his signature it is certain that as late as the twenty third of february being the ninth day after the bill was presented to him he had arrived at no satisfactory conclusion for on that day he addressed a note to general hamilton in which he informs him that this bill was presented to me by the joint committee of congress at twelve o'clock on monday the fourteenth instant and he requested his opinion to what precise period by legal interpretation of the constitution can the president retain it in his possession before it becomes a law by the lapse of ten days if the proper construction was that the day on which the bill was presented to the president and the day on which his action was had upon it were both counted to be inclusive then the time allowed him within which it would be competent for him to return it to the house in which it originated with his objections would expire on thursday the twenty fourth of february general hamilton on the same day returned an answer in which he states i give it as my opinion that you have ten days exclusive of that on which the bill was delivered to you and sundays hence in the present case if it is returned on friday it will be in time by this construction which the president adopted he gained another day for deliberation and it was not until the twenty fifth of february that he signed the bill thus affording conclusive proof that he had at last obtained his own consent to sign it not without great and almost insuperable difficulty additional light has been recently shed upon the serious doubts which he had on the subject amounting at one time to a conviction that it was his duty to withhold his approval from the bill this is found among the manuscript papers of mr madison authorized to be purchased for the use of the government by an act of the last session of congress and now for the first time accessible to the public from these papers it appears that president washington while he yet held the bank bill in his hands actually requested mr madison at that time a member of the house of representatives to prepare the draft of a veto message for him mr madison at his request did prepare the draft of such a message and sent it to him on the twenty first of february seventeen ninety one a copy of this original draft in mr madison's own handwriting was carefully preserved by him and is among the papers lately purchased by congress it is preceded by a note written on the same sheet which is also in mr madison's handwriting and is as follows february twenty first seventeen ninety one copy of a paper made out and sent to the president at his request to be ready in case his judgment should finally decide against the bill for incorporating a national bank the bill being then before him among the objections assigned in this paper to the bill and which were submitted for the consideration of the president are the following i object to the bill because it is an essential principle of the government that powers not delegated by the constitution cannot be rightfully exercised because the power proposed by the bill to be exercised is not expressly delegated and because i cannot satisfy myself that it results from any express power by fair and safe rules of interpretation the weight of the president of the bank of seventeen ninety one and the sanction of the great name of washington which has been so often invoked in its support are greatly weakened by the development of these facts the experiment of that bank satisfied the country that it ought not to be continued and at the end of twenty years congress refused to recharter it it would have been fortunate for the country and saved thousands from bankruptcy and ruin had our public men of eighteen sixteen resisted the temporary pressure of the times upon our financial and pecuniary interests and refused to charter the second bank of this the country became abundantly satisfied and at the close of its twenty years duration as in the case of the first bank 
it also ceased to exist under the repeated blows of president jackson it reeled and fell and a subsequent attempt to charter a similar institution was arrested by the veto of president tyler mr madison in yielding his signature to the charter of eighteen sixteen did so upon the ground of the respect due to precedents and as he subsequently declared the bank of the united states though on the original question held to be unconstitutional received the executive signature it is probable that neither the bank of seventeen ninety one nor that of eighteen sixteen would have been chartered but for the embarrassments of the government in its finances the derangement of the currency and the pecuniary pressure which existed the first the consequence of the war of the revolution and the second the consequence of the war of eighteen twelve both were resorted to in the delusive hope that they would restore public credit and afford relief to the government and to the business of the country end of section twelve recording by colleen mcmahon